Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this segment of Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. Tonight, we are going to explore Germany's fascist story. My name is Ben Green, and I'll be with you as a moderator tonight. And now I'd like to welcome our tour guide for the evening, Rick Steves. Hi, Rick. Hey, Ben. Thank you. And it's great to be your tour guide tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. This is our fourth week of Monday Night Travels. And today we're all together. I'm in my living room. You're in your living room with your best travel partner, I hope. And we're just getting together and celebrate our love of travel. And uh, I got to say, I one of the things I really miss about uh, during this pandemic and so on is, of course, traveling, but also getting out and giving talks around the country. That's what I do when I'm not in Europe. And I'm just so thankful that we can get together every Monday night and share some travels. So next week, we're going to be in Cairo. The next, we're going to cruise the Nile. After that, we're going to have a special celebration of European Christmases in seven different countries. And after that, we're going to go to Ethiopia. We've got lots of travels coming your way. Right now, we're going to go to Germany. We're going to go back about 80 or 90 years ago, and we're going to learn some hard lessons. And the Germans have certainly learned these lessons, and we're going to learn them also. You know, we like to think of this as a party. And I've got my good German beer. And uh, it is a little bit odd to be thinking of a party while we're learning about fascism. But I'd like to celebrate the importance of democracy and how we can learn from history and how great it is to travel thoughtfully in a way that we come home with that better understanding. You know, we're going to be talking about fascism in Germany. And Germany certainly knows and respects the specter of fascism. Germany has a strong democracy now, but Germany knows that you need to invest in your electorate in order to have a smart enough electorate not to be dumbed down and bamboozled by some charismatic wannabe autocrat because Germany knows the tragic consequences of that. Germany knows the importance of investing in its electorate, getting a first class education, and also recognizing honestly the frustrations of the people in a society that might become the base of an angry, fear-mongering, hate-mongering autocrat that can derail that great society. So we've got a couple thousand people gathered here today. I'm so thankful you're here. And I wanna remind you that every week when we get together, we try to mix it up with uh, appropriate uh, food and drink. I'm, I'm, uh, I've got my, my beer here. And when you're in Germany, of course it's beer. I don't go for the, the wheat beer, the, the Hefeweizen when I'm at home, but it sure tastes good when I'm in Germany because I'm a cultural chameleon. And when I'm there, if the people in Munich are drinking their Hefeweizen, I'm going to be drinking it too. Now this is Hefeweizen is a wheat beer. It's a vice beer. It's nicknamed a white beer, but Hefeweizen is literally wheat yeast. And uh, this is Paulaner. And Paulaner is one of six big breweries that are famous at Oktoberfest. They got one of those big tents along with five other breweries. And it says right here, since 1634, 400 years, monks have been made. Well, they don't, monks don't make it now, but originally this is monk made beer. And 400 years ago in Munich, there was a law. It's a famous law that they just love. And it said, there's only four ingredients, water, hops, yeast, and malt. And I was reading the label of this thing. And to this day, that's all that's in here. Now this is called wheat beer because more than 50% of it is literally wheat yeast, all right? And um, the taste is, uh, it's less hoppy. It's sweet and, and malty and a uh, little carbonated. And again, have it in Munich. <laughs> I, I just think it's great when you're in Munich, if you look around, everybody's drinking that wheat beer, have it. Also, we've got our little spread. And when I'm in a beer hall, and we're gonna be in a lot of beer halls tonight, because that's where the action was as the Nazis were, were getting their springboard going, we've got radishes. When you go to a beer hall, you get a big radish cut in a long spiral, sprinkled with uh, uh, salt and brought to you by a waitress in a dirndl in a very traditional way. You've got your sauerkraut and this sauerkraut, I just want to eat it. Mm. When they sell it to me in a German market, they call it a vitamin bomb. And it's just so healthy. I've got some nice cheese. I've got some horseradish sauce. And if you get a chance in Germany to have horseradish sauce, it's just a great way to put a little accent on everything. And then you got your bratwurst. And a bratwurst is a link sausage, usually veal or pork. This happens to be pork 
Also, I made a special effort today. I couldn't find a big pretzel like I'd get in Germany, but I wanted to give you my nice dugout canoe full of first class bread because when you're in Germany, Germans really appreciate and enjoy their bread. So that's my snacks for the day. Um, let's see, I'd like to um, start off by saying the word fascism comes from this. This is my show and tell. This is a fascia. And this was the symbol for Mussolini in Italy and Hitler and so on, fascism. The idea is that if you take one of these pieces of wood, you can break it individually on your knee. But if you lash them all together, it becomes very strong. And if a society marches in lockstep together, it cannot be broken. It is invincible. That's the whole idea of a fascia. And it comes with a ax. Now, my, my guide, when I was putting this together, this is from, we, did, we opened in Italy in our fascism show. Uh, she said, you've got to have the ax because the ax embedded in this pile of sticks is a reminder that it is discipline that helps a fascist society stay in lockstep and be strong. Without the ax, you don't have the strength that comes with the fascist form of government. Well, we're gonna be learning about fascism here in the next hour, in the next half an hour. Now, we originally produced this show in a one hour version. I had to distill it down to make it one of our episodes in 30 minutes. And uh, we took out Italy and we took out a lot of the World War II stuff and, and distilled it down. And then we pumped up the sightseeing dimension of it. So that's what this half hour episode you're gonna see today is all about. Fascism and the story of Germany distilled from our one hour fascism special. Now, with all the politics and difficulties in our country right now, a lot of people look at this show and they think, are you just saying that Hitler and Trump are like in the same category? And of course not. That's way over the top. There's nothing, I mean, Trump is nowhere near like Hitler, but there's nothing over the top about recognizing the fragility of our democracy and how an autocrat, an autocrat like Trump can derail that democracy whether you're on the far left or the far right, it's not over the top to recognize that our democracy is not impervious to an autocrat that reads from the same playbook as Mussolini and Hitler. So we're gonna learn about that playbook because that's the playbook that autocrats in Poland, Hungary, Turkey, and perhaps even in our country are following in order to have their way with democracy. So as you watch this, count the ways that Hitler could teach a wannabe autocrat how to a, a take power, even if they're not elected by a majority. Okay, let's go now to Germany, and we're going to learn from the German story 80 years ago. And I would like to remind you, we started the show right here under the arcade in what's called the Haus der Kunst. And the Haus der Kunst in Munich is the best piece of uh, Hitler architecture surviving in Munich. And I had to run around and look for the best piece of architecture to do the two on cameras we start the show with, because that's the on cameras that kicked off the German version of the one hour fascism special. Here we are in Munich. Let's learn about fascism from Germany. No, actually this time it's the worst of Europe. In this special episode, we'll travel together through Germany and learn. I'm going to start. Up. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. No, actually, this time it's the worst of Europe. In this special episode, we'll travel together through Germany and learn from the hard lessons of fascism that this country learned from nearly a century ago and why it matters. Thanks for joining us. As so once again, this building, the Haus der Kunst, it means literally the house of art. And it was the house of art and then Hitler didn't like modern art. So he turned it into the house of degenerate art. And this is where he had a show that showed all the art that just really ticked him off before he got rid of it. Today, Hitler would hate this building because it's filled with the modern art that he so despised. I wanna remind you, this show has had 
three iterations really, because I want to get this message out there. It was the one hour fascism special. Then it came back again as a pledge uh, event all over public television. And it really had a remarkable run as a pledge show around the country. And now as we bring out our season 11, it's one of eight shows in season 11 distilled out of that hour. We've got the, um, uh, the Germany fascism special here. Democracies are being threatened throughout the West by the rise of angry populist masses and wannabe autocrats. Thoughtful travels reveal that history is speaking to us. Traveling through Germany today, you see many reminders of the rise and fall of Nazism and the devastation wrought by its fascist leader, Adolf Hitler. In this episode, we'll travel to places that evoke those terrible times in Germany and see a few of the sites and memorials that recall that country's fascist nightmare. We'll learn how, in Germany, fascism rose and then fell, taking millions of people with it. Along the way, we'll learn from Germans whose families lived through those times. You do not trust in anybody any longer after the burning of books. And see how Germany guards against the rise of fascism again. Throughout Germany, we'll see sites related to fascism. We'll start where Hitler got his political start, Munich. Then we'll visit Nuremberg the site of his notorious political rallies. Berchtesgarten, home of his getaway, the Eagle's Nest. And Berlin, the capital and site of German fascism's downfall. In 1918, World War I ended, leaving 10 million dead and Europe in ruins. The chaotic aftermath of the war created fertile ground for the seeds of fascism. Nowhere was that more true than in defeated and devastated Germany. After World War I, Germany was in a shambles. After a humiliating defeat and the loss of over two million men, they were forced by the Allies to pay costly war reparations. Their emperor had abdicated and was replaced by a weak democracy. The economy was terrible, unemployment was high, and inflation was out of control. Germans had no faith in their government to get society back on track. So I want to remind you, this is a big deal. 1918, the stab in the back. There is a conspiracy theory that Jews and communists and bad people gave up in World War I and Germany could have won the war. And that delegitimized their government. And then 12, 14 years later, Hitler rose uh, and took over power. But uh, he tried to rise right here. He didn't make it, but he came back because, to a great extent, about that stab in the back conspiracy. I just, if you can delegitimize an election, you can come back later and rally your base around the fact that that election was delegitimized. Therefore, the government you're trying to overthrow is delegitimized. It happens today and it happened back then. In this vacuum of power, a fringe movement claiming to be the champion of the oppressed emerged. They dressed in intimidating brown shirt uniforms, roamed the streets in gangs, and wanted to restore Germany's national pride. They called themselves the National Socialists, or Nazis. Their leader, Adolf Hitler. Those early Nazis found a natural base here in Munich. So Munich is a great town for sightseeing, obviously, and there's plenty of Third Reich sightseeing to do here. There's wonderful uh, Third Reich walking tours, and you'll walk by things you wouldn't understand without a guide that are beautifully, are not, they're, they're intimately tied in with the rise of National Socialism. From in Munich, you've got a documentation center, and this is something that has only come out in the last generation. Actual documentation centers designed to teach the German citizenry what happened when we had the advent of fascism of their grandfather's time. And then from Munich, you can make side trips very easily to Dachau and to Berchtesgarten, both of which we'll see in this show. When you look at this square, we're looking at the medieval town center of, of Munich. Uh, of course, Munich was just a pile of rubble in 1945, as were most of the great cities in Germany. Uh, each city in the late 40s had to decide how are we going to rebuild? Is it going to be on the Manhattan st uh, uh, plan, which was like Frankfurt, meaning throw away all that middle medieval cute stuff and the higgly piggly back lanes and just make it a grid plan and a no nonsense, you know, banking capital of the future? Or are you going to build on your medieval floor plan, your medieval street plan? Munich chose the medieval street plan. And that's why today you still have the circular wall, or you can see it, you've got the old gates and you've got the characteristic old town. Great for um, tourism, that's for sure. 
While a pleasant and idyllic city today, this capital of Bavaria was known for its conservative and nationalistic passions. Nazi street gangs violently attacked unwanted outsiders, Jews, and communists. Look at that shot. There was so much powerful footage that our staff, uh, basically Steve Camarano and Simon Griffith, found to make this show work. Amazing stock footage, as you'll see. In a moment, we're going into a beer hall. And when you go into a beer hall in Munich, you do feel the ghosts of those early, these guys here, the very first Nazis, because that's where they had their meetings. In fact, the most touristy beer hall of all, the Hofbrauhaus, has history connected to that guy. In 1920, the very first National Socialist meetings before Hitler was even a big shot in the movement were taking place in the Hofbrauhaus. When I was a kid visiting the Hofbrauhaus and the different beer halls in Munich, I remember vividly the, the place was overrun with two crowds, tourists and deranged veterans of World War II suffering from PTSD before PTSD had a word, a name for it. I mean, one-legged people that would, would sing old war songs and, and thrust their fists up in the sky. And it was a fascinating mix to see that diehard spirit of Nazism hobbling around on one leg with their mental disturbances as Germany was trying still to rebuild, even in the 1970s, from the tragedy of World War II and Hitler. In 1923, in a beer hall like this, the original Nazi leadership gathered their followers. They were impatient and eager to take power. Hitler waved his pistol in the air and called for the revolution to begin. Hitler led the ragtag revolutionaries in the beer hall into the streets of Munich, planning to overthrow the government. But that attempted revolt, called the Beer Hall Putsch, failed. I'm going to be breaking in a lot just because it's fun and I've got you. You're a, you're a, <laughs> you're a trapped audience. Uh, I want to remind you, you can watch this show uninterrupted anytime you want at ricksteves.com. Go to the TV section and you can watch the one hour version, which is obviously double the content. But I just wanted to point out right here in the show, there's a lot of heavy, uh, on, long on cameras. I pride myself in memorizing my on cameras and not using a teleprompter normally. But we shot this show in a scramble and we used a teleprompter because the on cameras were very long and we just didn't have the time to mess around in them. But you can see in my left hand, I'm holding the um, remote. You can see my thumb on it there. And uh, don't look at that because you're not supposed to know I've got a remote to read, to operate the teleprompter from a distance. After a bloody confrontation, the police crushed it here at Odeonsplatz. Hitler was arrested and sent to jail. And it seemed that Germany's fascist movement was finished before it got off the ground. Unable to overthrow the government by force, Hitler resolved to take it by political means. While in prison, he wrote Mein Kampf, or My Struggle, which preaches his message of uniting all ethnic Germans and giving them more space to live. Once out of prison, Hitler managed to take power within the existing political system. Shaping his National Socialist Party into a political entity, he put forward a populist strategy, rousing a disillusioned workforce, reviving a struggling economy, and fixing what was considered a weak government. At first, the boom times of the Roaring Twenties blunted his populist message. But then, the Great Depression hit in 1929. The working masses were angry again, and Hitler's promises gained traction. Fascism was now taking root in Germany. Look at that beautiful spot for an on-camera. I'm just really into finding good spots for on-cameras. It's just such a fun challenge when you're making a TV show. Uh, we got to do an on-camera whenever we have information we can't cover by things you can physically look at. And uh, that's a beautiful setup. That's right there. That's the, uh, national, the old National Gallery in Berlin. It's on the Museum Island. And it's right next to the Pergamon Museum where everybody goes, and also the museum with uh, Nefertiti, the great Egyptian bust. But um, you got to check out the old National Gallery because it's filled with romantic art from the 1870s when Germany was a new country and everybody was celebrating the legitimacy of Germany. It's a complicated history but to study you know World War II and Hitler and all that you really got to start back in 1870 when Germany was united and all of a sudden that up, up sort of upended all of the stability in Europe. <laughs> 
So coming up now, we're going to hear from local guides. It was critical for us to get local guides to explain the story because they had so much more credibility than me on these complicated and important issues. There were long interviews. We had to find quiet places to sit down with our guides. Uh, one of them was on the steps of the parade grounds in Nuremberg. Another one was in the backyard of my favorite hotel in Berlin, uh, Hotel Jorin. And uh, another was in the garden of my favorite Italian restaurant just near the train station in Munich where I always end up uh, staying. But these are German voices that can speak fluently, ad-libbing, powerfully powerfully about their country's story. So I want to thank Andreas, Holger, George, and Thomas, four great guides who you're going to meet now. And each of them were really good at showing the parallels I've been talking about with the tricks of today's populist leaders being acted out a century ago. Bombastic wannabe autocrats promising jobs, 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 blaming the communists, making simple solutions telling big lies repeatedly and confidently until people start to think, well, maybe they're true. Stoking their base with rallies, goosing the economy so people would support them even if they had to hold their nose because it was good for their retirement accounts. Using the radio, the mass media of the day so expertly. In a moment, we're gonna meet George, who we literally took out of the Oktoberfest beer tents. He was a little bit drunk. We had to take off all of his, you know, he had his fancy, felt hat with the feather and all the bit and pins and everything. And we had to have him change gears from Oktoberfest to German tour guide talking about fascism. But I just got to say, we couldn't have done the show without our wonderful local guides. So Hitler promised jobs, jobs, jobs to everybody. Um, and of course, people needed Jobs. Hitler promised the people everything, everything they wanted. He promised them a bright future. He promised them work. He promised them Lebensraum, living space. Hitler was a powerful, mesmerizing speaker. People were taken by Hitler's speech, not so much by the beauty of his arguments, but by his sheer fanaticism, by his anger, by his rage and his repetitive rhetoric. And people, eyewitness accounts, describe it as a barbaric, primitive effect. He repeated a lie endlessly and he didn't make it a small lie, he made it a big lie and he kept hammering it into their heads. He also dumped it down as much as possible. His simplistic promises were made to order for his political base. More prosperity and expanded borders for more room in which to live, or Lebensraum. Fascism is perceived as a strong movement with simple answers for complicated problems. He blamed Germany's problems on scapegoats like Jews and communists, and fears that the communist revolution in Russia would spread to Germany. In 1932, the Nazi party won only about a third of the seats in parliament, but Hitler managed to put together a ruling coalition and was appointed chancellor in January 1933. Suddenly, Adolf Hitler was heading a new German government. Then, just a few weeks into Hitler's rule, under mysterious circumstances, there was a fire in Germany's parliament building, or Reichstag. A disaster like this, which many historians believe was actually the work of Hitler's people, is an answer to an aspiring dictator's prayer. With this national security emergency, Hitler now had his excuse to crush the communists, silence moderates, and create laws giving him sweeping new powers. Suddenly, in Germany, there was no middle ground. You were either with Hitler or against him. Hitler followed a playbook that has inspired autocrats left and right ever since. Think about that. You have the burning of the Reichstag. And the next day, Hitler is able to really consolidate his authoritarian rule. You lose your democracy incrementally. Little by little, you hardly notice it's being taken away from you. And the same time, the wannabe autocrat, the wannabe dictator is creating a society that wants law and order. When you hear law and order and you're losing your freedom, all you need to do is wait for 
some disaster, a burnt Reichstag building, a burnt, you know, um, Congress, um, 9-11. After 9-11, right away, we had the Patriots Act. I mean, it may have been justified, but the government certainly has more power when it has the Patriots Act. Uh, in Turkey, just recently, Erdogan was struggling, and all of a sudden, there's a failed coup. In the next month, Erdogan is much more powerful because he capitalized on that. I was standing here in front of this parliament building, which to me is such a, it's a historic pilgrimage for anybody who likes to learn from history. And you can see the glass dome that they built out of that bombed out shell. Later on in the show, we'll see the last fighting of World War II on the rooftop there as communists from, from uh, the Soviet Union fought Nazis on their last stand on the top of their parliament building. So much to share right there. I was excited to do the on camera here and it happened to be a day when there was a huge uh, gay rights parade. Everybody around was just, it was a great festival of gay rights and it was starting to rain. And I was thinking, how can we ever, ever do this on camera talking about fascism in a fire? But the cameraman framed it right and we managed to pull it off and it worked just great. In Berlin, so much sightseeing related to this. Within a 10 minute walk of the Reichstag building, you've got, well, of course you can tour the Reichstag building and go to the very top of that. I was up there on the opening day surrounded by teary eyed Germans celebrating the fact that their country was no longer divided, no more communism, no more fascism. It was a united country looking into a promising future with a new, beautiful, beautiful new capital building. You can tour that about a four block walk down the Unter den Linden, you've got the German um, History Museum, the best museum in Germany for 20th century history for sure. Uh, you've got Hitler's bunker, the site where he committed suicide, now just a parking lot, we'll go there in a minute. And just between me and this building, there's a, a monument we'll, we'll see in a moment, which is a memorial to the German politicians who were murdered by Hitler. 96 politicians, 96 congressmen and senators of Germany in 1933 refused to buckle under Hitler and they voted against him in the parliament. And immediately after that, they were arrested, taken to a concentration camp and never again saw their freedom. 96 of them died. It's amazing to think what happened in Germany 90 years ago. Hitler proceeded to consolidate his power in the most ruthless ways. He locked up the few courageous politicians who voted against him and established his total control of the German government. This poignant memorial remembers those who tried to resist Hitler's power grab. The German equivalent of congressmen and senators, they were quickly silenced. You can see the dates they were arrested, sent to concentration camps, and executed. Hitler had hijacked Germany's democracy. He was given extraordinary powers to temporarily suspend democratic procedures in order to get things done. A dictator now in charge of a mighty industrial nation, Hitler and his team began to lay out his plan for Germany and the world. Inheriting a German economy suffering from the Great Depression, including an unemployment rate of nearly 30%, Hitler quickly turned to improving the economy. He accelerated the previous government's policy of large public works and infrastructure projects financed with deficit spending. As a result, employment increased dramatically from 1933 to 1936. Despite this new focus on jobs and the German worker, the Nazis had no use for labor unions. Well, fascism basically hates everything communist, or Bolshevik, as they call it. So they would not uh, like trade unions. They were not within the frame of the fascist uh, movement. One year into their government, they declared May Day a holiday for the first time the union celebrated. The next day when they were hung over, more or less, they smashed the unions. Despite having the term socialist in the party name, Hitler was a friend of industry. He privatized many industries and the corporations that had supported his candidacy continued to back him. Corporations would support the Nazi government of Germany because it was good for their profits. With all this economic activity and employment, Hitler re-energized Germany. Much of Germany was swept up in Hitler's charismatic vision, and the country had a common purpose. Everywhere he went, crowds adored him. Women swooned when his car drove by. In clubs called the Hitler Youth, boys and girls pledged their allegiance to him. 
A little boy in 1935, when he looked at Hitler, he would see a godlike person. He was somebody who would elevate the German people, who would elevate the people of this boy to become the perfect master race running the planet. Hitler became known by a new title, which meant he was their leader, their Führer. I'm the idea about fascism is to have a big community that all operates exactly the same way and to have a common opinion that covers all. There was one phrase that was called Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer. One people, one empire, one leader. Full stop. There was a dark side to all this Nazi conformity. Individuality was lost. Individualism doesn't even exist in fascism. It doesn't exist in any aspect. It doesn't exist in art. It doesn't exist in lectures at university. It doesn't exist in uh, newspapers and press. For the Nazis, the city that most embodied their sense of national unity was Nuremberg. Nuremberg, so steeped in German history, was nicknamed the most German of German cities. That's one reason it was a favorite of Hitler's to showcase his nationalistic pomp and pageantry, to inspire all of Germany to get on board. There were three German Reichs, or empires. The first was medieval. It was called the Holy Roman Empire. In fact, the emperor's castle still towers above Nuremberg. The Second Reich was 19th century, the creation of the modern German state by Prussia under the leadership of Bismarck. And it was here in Nuremberg that Hitler declared the Third Reich, a powerful German empire to last a thousand years. I'll never forget walking up that stairway behind me and smelling urine, a very strong smell of urine. And then noticing the bottom of that door was just rusted to oblivion because it is a ritual, it is tradition for German men to come there and pee on the door. That door is the door that leads to the golden room. And it's the most sumptuous green room, you know, where the uh, VIPs would sit before going on stage. It's the size of that building, basically. And it's just beautifully mosaic. I'd never seen it before this film. It's not open to the public. We didn't show it um, on our TV show. We never show things that you can't see on your own because we are committed to showing you what you can do on your trip. That's part of our ethic. But boy, that green room was powerful. And so was the smell of that urine. You know, if you're trying to do a documentary on the story of fascism in Germany, Nuremberg, Munich, and Berlin, it's all you need right there. There is so much to see. And of those, Nuremberg is the city that is the least touristic and has the surprising lot to offer. It's got this amazing documentation center right here at the fairgrounds. Uh, and you've also got uh, the Congress Hall, which we're going to visit in just a minute. You know, in my tours, we have an ethic of never going to Germany without visiting a concentration camp and essentially making a pilgrimage to the place of all of this um, horror and slaughter of the Holocaust. And uh, uh, either uh, every, every tour itinerary can choose a concentration camp. On our 13-day Best of Germany itinerary on our bus tours, we go to Berlin, we go to Munich, we go to Hamburg. We do not go to Nuremberg. It didn't quite make it in the top 13 days. But I do want to remind you that if you want the specifics on anything about the Hitler sightseeing or anything that we're seeing in this show, everything I've got on Germany is covered in this Rick Steves guidebook to Germany, which is 30% off during our Christmas sale right now. I do want to remind you that when you go to Germany, you're going to be um, connecting with the culture in the beer halls. And you've got all of that great sort of energy. And you're going to have on our TV shows, we always do a meal. We didn't do a meal on this one. So I just want to make an extra little mm, temptation of your sauerkraut, your radishes, your cheese, your bratwurst, and your horseradish sauce. And remind you, one of the most important words when you go to a beer hall anywhere in Germany, zum wohl, to your help. OK. When Hitler took power, he made Nuremberg's Zeppelin Field the site of his enormous Nazi party rallies. Today, the stark remains of this massive gathering place are thought-provoking. German tour guide Thomas Schmechtig is joining me for some insight. For several years, increasingly elaborate celebrations of Nazi culture, ideology, and power took place right here. Fascist dictators understood the propaganda power of big rallies, where they can manufacture the adoration of their people. 
bask in it, and then broadcast it to the rest of the population. As Hitler said, turning the little man into part of a great dragon. Imagine Hitler stepping out of that door, overlooking the masses, 200,000 people being lined up. He used propaganda to create a new community. In fact, we even have a word for it. It's called Volksgemeinschaft. Inspirational image. Look at those banners. You don't see those banners in museums anywhere. There are tons of banners like these that survive. But Germany has decided it's just too dangerous to have them out because it can be something that neo-Nazis can rally around. There's this latent sort of smoldering anti-Semitism, neo-Nazism going on. And it's just Germany really cares about that. So all of these things, while they exist, they're locked up and out of sight of the public. You won't even see a lot of medallions. I mean, everybody was decorated with all sorts of um, buttons and ribbons and military decorations. If you were a German Nazi hero in 1945 and suddenly you've lost the war, the first thing you're going to do is look around your house and think, what can I get rid of so people don't know I was an enthusiastic Nazi? The lakes of Germany are the lake beds of Germany is where you look for Nazi regalia. Everybody went out onto the lake and dumped all their all of their prized medallions celebrating their heroic Nazism in the lake. And suddenly, nobody was a Nazi anymore. It's a fascinating story what Germany went through. What a difficult time for a great nation. And what a fascinating thing to follow in your travels. This is from Lenny Riefenstahl's propaganda movie, Triumph of the Will, were filmed at the 1934 Nuremberg rallies and then shown in theaters and schoolrooms throughout the country. The goal? To bring a visual celebration of the power of the Nazi state to all 70 million Germans. Nuremberg shows the enormous power of fascism's secret weapon, propaganda. Looming over a now peaceful lake in Nuremberg is another remnant of the dictator's megalomania, his huge yet unfinished Nazi Congress Hall. Hitler, who believed he would create a new civilization based upon fascist values, modeled this building after the ancient Roman Colosseum, but even more colossal. Imagine 50,000 leading Nazis in here, one third higher, covered by a roof, a window inside the ceiling, sunshine would have fallen down to the podium, once a year, one speech of Adolf Hitler. Another stage set for this propaganda show was Hitler's mountain-capping eagle's nest. This alpine getaway just south of Munich in Berchtesgarten was used to soften Hitler's image against a majestic, almost theatrical backdrop. His visits were lovingly filmed to show him as the embodiment of all that was good about Germany. Healthy, vigorous, respectable, everyone's favorite uncle. Set in the scenic foothills of the Alps, it was built in 1938 as a mountain retreat for Hitler and his guests. A stone tunnel crafted with fascist precision leads to Hitler's plush elevator, which still whisks visitors to the top. Because it was in this corner of Bavaria that Hitler claimed to be inspired and laid out his dark vision, some call Berchtesgarten the Cradle of the Third Reich. Hold that thought, Rick. So here we have the Luftwaffe headquarters. This is the Hitler building that survives the best in Berlin. It's the former headquarters of the Air Force, the Luftwaffe. Today, it's still a government building. Uh, they're very sensitive about where you can stick your tripod and where you can film if you're making a TV show. We did not have permission to film the building. We begged and pleaded. And finally, the guard there said, you can set your tripod outside on the sidewalk and I can stand inside. So here I am. I wanted to get that frame, that powerful National Socialist architecture, but the tripod is out on the, on the sidewalk. This is uh, maybe a familiar image because uh, in 2008, uh, Tom Cruise starred in a movie called Valkyrie. And it was the story of Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg who uh, tried to assassinate Hitler. It's amazing when you look at uh, Tom Cruise and Stauffenberg, they look like the same person. I mean, it's amazing how they, they are a spitting image of each other. And you've noticed a lot of the, the stirring national socialist architecture in that film, including the Luftwaffe here in Berlin. Hitler may have stoked Germany's economy and put people back to work, but it was becoming clear that whatever benefits fascism might bring to its political base, it had a darker side, and it came at a huge cost. 
Despite its veneer of respectability and its popularity among ordinary people, the thriving fascist state relied on increasingly brutal repression. Hitler continued his ruthless creation of a totalitarian fascist state. The free press was silenced, as were intellectuals and universities. Art was expected to be naturalistic, and Germans to be depicted as blonde, blue-eyed, and wholesome. Books that caused people to question the Nazi agenda were forbidden and publicly burned with delight by Hitler's supporters. If you have some books, titles of those books that were burned the night before, and you invite some people, they can argue against you because you have those books in your private library. And even your roommate has an argument against you. You do not trust in anybody any longer after the burning of books. One famous German writer and author said, once you're burning books, very soon you're going to burn people. Wow, I never fully appreciated the power of the burning of the books ritual until George explained it when we were right there. I mean, today, when, when you go to a friend's house, you, you psychoanalyze them, you know, you wanna see what's on their bookshelf, what do they believe in, who, who are they excited about, what do they embrace? Imagine the day after the burning of books, suddenly you have to look around and you wonder, what in my world here betrays my politics? And who can you trust? Because you couldn't trust anybody. So many people were working with the government. By the way, we've got some time for questions and answers. So please, if you have a question, fill it out uh, during the show uh, in, in the Q&A widget there. Also, to see this program, I, I, I hesitate to break into it because it's, it's pretty heavy stuff and it's better to watch it straight through if you get a chance. You can see the one hour version of this program or the half hour German only version uh, if you go to ricksteves.com and look in the TV section. Um, also remember this a recording of this event right here will be posted at Rick Steves on Facebook tomorrow as we do every Monday with Monday Night Travels. Artifacts and posters in Berlin's German History Museum illustrate the Nazi notion of a master race. Anyone who didn't fit their model could be viewed as an enemy of the state and sent to concentration camps. The Nazis required those they imprisoned to wear badges that identified their status. Political traitor, lawbreaker, foreigner, homosexual, and a catch-all, asocial, anyone who would not conform. A special badge, the Yellow Star of David, went to Hitler's lowest of the low, the Jews. The Nazis believed that the German people were the master race, the toughest, the strongest, the bravest, the smartest. Yeah. They said we should be running the planet, we just can't do it because this conspiracy, the Jewish world conspiracy is in the way. And without them, if we deal with that conspiracy, then we will achieve our rightful status again. The Nazis started putting their anti-Semitic ideas into action as early as April of 1933, when they organized a boycott of Jewish businesses. He specifically blamed one group, the Jewish people, for ruining things for everybody else. For him, it was clear his scapegoat was the Jews. They were the source of all evil in Germany and in the world, and he wanted to kind of get rid of that evil, and that's what he worked for. Then, in November of 1938, the Nazis led a pogrom against Jews throughout Germany. During Kristallnacht, or the Night of the Broken Glass, as it was called, Jewish homes, hospitals, and schools were ransacked. 7,000 Jewish businesses were damaged or destroyed, and over 1,000 synagogues were burned. And 30,000 Jews were arrested and put in concentration camps. This was a turning point from earlier economic, political, and social persecution to physical beatings, incarceration, and even murder. It was the beginning of Hitler's final solution. Today, Berlin's topography of terror exhibit stands on the rubble of what was once the most feared address in Berlin, the headquarters of the Gestapo secret police and the elite SS force. It was from here that government employees managed the Nazi state and dispassionately coordinated its most ruthless activities. The efficient and heartless bureaucracy behind Hitler's crimes gave rise to the expression, the banality of evil. The banality of evil. Look at these people. Look at these 
proud boys. Their parents are so proud of them. This could really happen. Every time I, I, I share this TV show and these lessons, part of me goes, oh, come on, you know, and, uh, but my German guides are so passionate about sharing this story. They understand that this fascist nightmare could happen with seemingly good people when they're gripped by the fear and, and by, by a charismatic leader, even in our time. I've got, I've got to say, even in our country, you could lose your democracy. Of course, we're not there. We're not there. We're not even close to it. But when you see the passions and you see the power of the fear and, and the ruthlessness of politicians who are addicted to power and the spinelessness of the other politicians that want to be close to power, you can extend that trajectory and you can imagine it happening 80 or 90 years after this photograph was taken in a country whose democracy you thought was strong. Fascism in Germany turned ever more hateful and militaristic. And fascism in Italy, under Benito Mussolini, had been firmly rooted since the 1920s. Italian fascism practiced similar militaristic and expansionist policies. Peace in Europe was under threat, and war seemed inevitable. In 1939, Germany invaded Poland, and World War II began. The military might of Germany seemed unstoppable. Employing their fast, lightning war technique called Blitzkrieg, Hitler's mighty tanks and high-tech air force, the Luftwaffe, swept across Europe. France fell quickly, and suddenly Hitler was playing tourist at the Eiffel Tower. Soon, nearly all of the continent was under direct or indirect fascist rule. With their final victory seemingly inevitable, the Nazis tightened the screws within their own society. The evils of fascism were incremental. As its small evils became big evils, German society managed to be oblivious to its own atrocities. At first, concentration camps contained people who didn't conform. Then, they became forced labor camps. Eventually, the Nazis built death camps, which were located outside of Germany and therefore farther from public view. With what the Nazis called the final solution, the entire Jewish population was targeted for extermination. In total, approximately 6 million Jews died from Nazi persecution. 2.7 million of those died in death camps. Auschwitz-Birkenau in Poland was the biggest and most notorious concentration camp in the Nazi system. Seeing the camp can be difficult, but Auschwitz survivors want tourists to come here to try to appreciate the scale and the monstrosity of the place in human terms in hopes that this horror, known as the Holocaust, will never be forgotten. Will never be forgotten. The only way that it will never be forgotten, and it's important right now because the last living memory of the Holocaust, the last Jews with, with, the, with the concentration camp number tattooed on their wrists are passing away. And how are we gonna remember this? We're gonna remember it by heeding the wish of the victims of the Holocaust that we never forget. And we do that by making a pilgrimage to one of these concentration camps. It's a moral obligation for me as a tour guide and a tour organizer. We will not do a tour to Germany without visiting a concentration camp. And uh, a lot of people go, oh no, I don't really need to see that. Or I saw the thing, the museum in Washington DC and so on. No, you need to see a concentration camp. Um, there's a big recognition of that now in Germany. There was a time when it was very difficult for Germany and they weren't handling very well. Now they are. There was a time, there was decades when teachers ran out of time just before they got to Hitler and they didn't need to cover it in school and kids didn't know much about their own history from the 20th century. Now the year starts with Nazism and they are sure to finish Nazism in that term. And every student in Germany goes to a concentration camp with a teacher to learn their own dark history. We need to do that too as students of history and as thoughtful travelers. Um, uh, there's uh, several concentration camps that are worth knowing about. Dachau is the most accessible and in a lot of ways the most sanitized concentration camp, still plenty powerful. Madhausen is a stronger experience. That's on the Danube River coming into Vienna in a, in a, in a 
horrible uh, quarry where there was just untold suffering. And if you want to see the most powerful concentration camp, you need to go to Auschwitz in Poland. Germany does an admirable job of dealing with its hard history, but it can never be presented like the Poles, who were the great victims of Nazism. One way or another, you need to visit a concentration camp. To finally defeat fascism, the alliance of Hitler and Mussolini, it took a massive and heroic allied effort led by Britain, America, and the Soviet Union. Germany was overwhelmed as the combined military might of the allies closed in on the Third Reich. Finally, the Nazi capital of Berlin was liberated by Soviet troops. And Hitler finished his life here in Berlin deep underground, in a bunker below my feet, with his capital smoldering in ruins, the dictator committed suicide. Finally, in the spring of 1945, the war in Europe ended. The death toll was staggering. In addition to six million Jews, the Nazis killed hundreds of thousands of so-called undesirables. Over a million political and religious prisoners and nearly nine million Soviet and Polish citizens. Europe's experiment with fascism left the continent devastated, with entire societies needing to be rebuilt. Germany had to be reconstructed inside and out. The sweeping impact of fascism can be felt to this day in the many memorials across Europe that remind us of those horrific years. In Berlin, the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe is a touching and evocative field of gravestone-like pillars. It's designed to cause people to think and to ponder this horrible chapter in human history. A common refrain at many of these memorials is never again, but even today, in well-established democracies throughout the West, societies are facing many of the same emotions, frustrations, and inequities that a century ago opened the door to fascism in Europe. If I ask myself, could it happen again, I would say no, but it has happened in Germany and it might happen again. Fascism happened here in Germany, the center of civilization, in the land of Beethoven, Goethe, and Schiller, and if it could have happened here. It can happen anywhere in the world. Today, Germany deals responsibly with the legacy of pain it brought Europe. Germany knows the importance of a well-informed electorate. Every school child learns of the Holocaust with a visit to a concentration camp. And Nazi documentation centers in major cities tell the story. But perhaps most important is the preservation of government by the Constitution and the rule of law, and not by the dictates of a charismatic, all-powerful leader. One of the things that you can do to make sure that something like this will not happen here or in other countries is not trust people that promise you very easy answers for very complicated problems. It never works. As we've seen through the story of fascism in Germany, a charismatic leader rose to power through the democratic process and then seized extra-constitutional power by unlawful means. When citizens allowed this, individual freedoms and rights soon fell by the wayside and democracy was lost. While democracy was restored to Western Europe, it easily could have been lost forever, and the cost was millions of lives. As history continues to unfold around us today, it's important to remember that freedom and democracy are not guaranteed. We are all participants, and we are all responsible. The story of fascism in Europe has taught us that strong and charismatic leaders can capitalize on fear to lead a society astray. Democracy is fragile. It requires a vigilant and engaged populace. And if you take freedom for granted, you can lose it. Thanks for joining us. I'm Rick Steves. Until next time. Not keep on traveling. For this show, I wanted to say travel thoughtfully. Travel thoughtfully. Travel thoughtfully. Well, thank you so much for letting me share that with you. You know, um, it's just so exciting when we do travel that we can get close to that difficult story 
and bring it home, bring home the lessons. You know, democracy is fragile. And uh, every one of my guides was just trying to make it clear. If you take your freedom for granted, you can lose it. This makes me so thankful for our democracy and defensive of it also. Active citizens can keep our democracy strong. It's so great to have public broadcasting, public television that lets us bring this kind of programming home. No underwriter would ever touch a show like this. This uh, A show like this would not be seen in, on commercial stations, but it's public broadcasting that brings it to us. And I'm really thankful for that. And thankful for all of you for joining me for this showing. Hey, um, next week, we're going to uh, Cairo. And after that, we're going to the Nile. And right now, we're going to Gabe. Gabe, we've got some questions. Yes, um, thank you so much, Rick, for that wonderful presentation. And as always, before we get to questions, I was hoping, hoping that we could get a quick word from our sponsor. Hey, well, thank you very much. And you sure can. Our sponsor is Rick Steves Europe. We're a tour company. Last year, we took 30,000 Americans to Europe on 1,200 different tours, had a wonderful time. This year, we were all geared up for our best year ever. We were almost sold out. And then this COVID thing hit us. And now all 100 of us are hunkering down and we're getting through this. And uh, we are ready to ramp up when uh, the coast is clear. So we're just asking people who are in looking forward to traveling again in Europe to remember that uh, we've got our tour program primed and ready to go. Uh, last year, we printed up this 64 page, beautiful full color advertisement booklet for our tour program. Again, we took 30,000 people in, in 19, 2019. And uh, we've got the same brochure available, not printed, but as a PDF on our website at ricksteves.com. So you're welcome to go there and download it and let your travel dreams percolate. Look at that. We've got um, 40 different itineraries, including the best of Germany in 13 days, uh, um, an amazing tour of Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, and then another tour called Berlin, Prague, and Vienna in 12 days, and 40 other itineraries. One thing that we have new, which we're very excited about is that tour of Poland. In fact, we were slated to produce two TV shows this summer, but we had to cancel them, two shows in Poland and two shows in Iceland. But we're feeling very confident that uh, uh, probably late in the summer or, or the fall of next year, we'll be ramping up again. And our, our right now our tour program is taking names on a wish list so that we can let people who are curious about a particular tour know that the tour is going and we'd love to have you on board. So check out ricksteves.com for that. I do want to remind you that um, we've got our Christmas sale going on right now. Everything in the travel store is discounted between 20 and 50% off. I believe all the guidebooks are 30% off. And uh, the two books that I'm quite excited about now are the books that I just wrote last year, as if we were anticipating a time when we couldn't travel. These are books for your travel dreams. 100 Greatest Masterpieces in Europe. I've long wanted to collect my favorite 100 pieces of art and partner with my good friend, Gene Openshaw, to write them up. And this is a sweep through the story of Europe's his art in just a delightful coffee table book. It's called 100 Masterpieces, and that book has been very popular. And something I'd long wanted to do is collect my most, um, my favorite travel writing, basically, into a collection of 100 essays. And this is a 400-page book called For the Love of Europe. And it's fun to just uh, celebrate the love of Europe. And uh, here we've got, uh, I swept through all of the uh, chapters and took out all of the practical tips. No practical tips in there. That's in the guidebooks. This is just for the love of Europe. So that's available and uh, we've got lots more going on. Our publisher is very excited about our calendars. We've got uh, every year we produce a beautiful calendar with our best photographs. There's the wall hanging one and the day by day calendar and uh, lots of good stuff that way. Also, tomorrow is Giving Tuesday. And if you're in the mood to do something philanthropic, let me challenge you to consider advocacy. That's my favorite way to leverage my philanthropic giving. As a matter of fact, every Christmas I donate it's my number one gift of the year. I give a half a million dollars to Bread for the World if my travelers will match that. And uh, we're well on the way to doing it again this year like we did last year. The deal is, and you can go to the, on the landing page of our website, ricksteves.com and see the Bread for the World uh, challenge. But if you can afford a $100 gift to empower the work of Bread for the World in the halls of Congress to make sure we speak up for hungry people during this COVID crisis, both in our country and abroad, like speaking up for food stamps, or recognizing that development aid in the, in the poor world is, even if you don't love your neighbor, it's a good investment for a stable 
and more peaceful world. It's a good investment. If you can give $100 to Bread for the World, I will give $100 to Bread for the World. And what do I have? I've got my uh, gifts here. And on top of that, we're going to send you your choice. You get our three Christmas gifts, which is the Christmas book and the DVD and the uh, music CD of our favorite uh, pieces of music that we recorded while we were shooting our Christmas special. Or you can get the big box set with all the TV shows we've ever made as a thank you for supporting Bread for the World. So once again, if you want to make a difference on Giving Tuesday, there's a lot of good causes. Personally, I think advocacy leverages your giving the best. It makes the biggest difference because our politicians, our legislators want to do the right thing. They've just got to be encouraged to do that. And um, Bread for the World speaks up for hungry people and we empower them with that. Already, I just got the numbers, 2,284 people have given a total of $293,000. We're well on our way to our goal of 500,000. Then together, we'll empower Bread for the World with a million dollars this Christmas. And that's something to feel really good about. Enough of a commercial. Gabe, let's answer some questions. All right, Rick. Um, one question that I saw quite a few times um, and that I saw from Jessica specifically is um, people are wondering why did you feel that it was important to make this episode on fascism now? You know, I wanted to, I was concerned about it um, over the last few years. And I just decided I'm a historian and all over Europe, there are these populist, nativist, fear-mongering movements that are derailing their democracies. And then I've been seeing what's going on in our country also. And I just feel like we need to learn from history. And as a tour guide, that's what we do. All of our tour guides love to teach history and you teach history by being exposed to it. If I could learn these hard lessons and bring them home into a TV show, I thought I would be doing a good job of tour guiding. So it's quite timely. I wish it wasn't so timely, but we produced this fa fascism show, I think three or four years ago, and it's as timely now as it ever was. Um, I also had a question from Tina who said that, you know, a lot of people kind of rush to um, compare maybe our current political situation um, with the likes of fascist Germany. Um, are there any key differences that you see or reasons to be hopeful that we have tools that maybe 20th century Germans didn't? Well, we've got something called the deep state. And we've also got journalism. And when you have journalism, and when you got a deep state, it keeps politicians honest. And if I was a politician, and I wanted to have total power, the two things that would really frustrate me would be journalists and the deep state. And I would attack them all the time until I crippled them. And then I could have my path to power. And we've got institutions that are strong. Thank God we've got institutions that are strong. So no bombastic politician, no matter how much charisma he or she might have, whether they're far left or far right, can have an easy time derailing our democracy. But as Germans learned, we are not um, impervious to this. So um, yeah, there are parallels. Of course, there, you know, Hitler and Trump, you can't even, you wouldn't even say in, in the same breath that Hitler is, you know, far more um, evil and, and consequential. But the dynamic that a democracy can be derailed is so clear. And most of Europe was fascist. And every one of those fascist dictators that derailed democracies in Europe 80 years ago, they read out of a playbook. It's just do this, do this, do this, and do this. And Want to be autocrats today in our just right now in established democracies are doing the same thing. So if this show can shine a light on how we can learn from history, you know, history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it rhymes. And we are seeing a lot of that rhyme right now. Um, another question, Rick, that I that Brent asked is. Um, you talked a lot about how Germans have learned from their past and created a strong democracy. In your opinion, do you think that we in the United States, especially our educational system, does enough to teach students about how the United States has been the bad guy in certain situations? Um, I know you've said dissent is a patriotic act. Do you think that we in the US teach children to be critical enough of our own country? 
Yeah, dissent is patriotic. A lot of people say I'm a, I America bash. No, I America love. I have high expectations for my country. I would live and work nowhere else. But are we doing enough with our education? Education's critical. I mean, right now there's a big discussion going on and a lot of people want to um, whitewash the difficult corners of our history and make it sound like we are a nation that has nothing to be learning from in our past. And I think that's dangerous, frankly. I know it's been a tough thing in Germany. I saw a German parent with his child at a concentration camp standing in front of a display that showed the canisters of the, of the gas that killed thousands and thousands of Jews. And that father had to teach his child what his father did. That's difficult. And you see what that's a, a microcosm of what Germany has gone through. And in my early days of traveling, nobody talked about Hitler. It was a gap. The school year would finish just before the teachers were able to get to fascism and, and Nazism and think, you know, they breathed a, a sigh of relief and didn't have to cover it. Now in Germany, a whole year in the curriculum from day one is dedicated to the story of Hitler and fascism because Germany wants to learn from it. They've paid the price for not learning from it. Germany invests in its education. If I was, if I had a chance to help our budget be smarter and help our country be stronger, I would consider education as national defense. And I would take a little bit of the $800 billion a year we spend every year on military hardware and I would put it into education because you need to educate in your citizenry in order to have a strong democracy. In Europe, they invest in their citizenry. Uh, they've got a Erasmus program, it's called, that pays people to work and study in other countries so they can talk to each other and learn from each other. And I've noticed in Germany, anything dealing with the fascist story is government subsidized. It's really cheap to buy. I've got some great, even in English, history books I've, I've purchased in Berlin that were only the cost of the paper. Clearly, German taxpayers were paying so this tourist could read that book, take it home, and learn from it. All right. Um, uh, another question you had mentioned, um, you know, the, the visits to the concentration camps. Um, and I had Craig who was wondering, when you visit a concentration camp, are there is there kind of concentration camp etiquette? Is it, do you stay silent? Are you allowed to take photos? Um, do you have any tips for maybe traveling with children to a concentration camp? You know, that's a very, very good question. Um, I don't know if, if it's appropriate for small children to go there. It's a great act of parenting and teaching to take young people to a concentration camp, but it, when is it appropriate? It's a tough call, but I am concerned with adults and, uh, you know, um, older students who say, no, I saw a documentary of that, or no, I went to the museum in Washington, DC. I don't need to depress myself on my vacation by going to a concentration camp. No, there's nothing like going to a concentration camp. You need to go to a concentration camp. I've done that for, for three decades as a tour guide. It's tough. And then we go from the concentration camp. Everybody is on the bus and it's just glum city. And uh, then that evening we're, we're getting over it and we go to a beer hall and we're together again, you know, but um, it's an experience people, treasures, not quite the right word, they, they really value the experience. Um, the etiquette at the concentration camp, it's like going to a, a sacred site. Uh, you, I walk with my hands clasped, I speak in a whisper, um, you are taking it in, it's sullen. And there are people that are noisy and jocular when they're there, and it just feels so grating. So uh, take some leadership with the people you're with. Uh, expect the people around you to be respectful, because it is a shrine to six million Jews who were killed in the Holocaust, uh, not to mention lots of other people. So it's a powerful experience. It's a good experience. It's, a, it's an important experience. And... Um, you don't just go to Europe to go to have fun on the beach. You go to Europe to learn or you're wasting an opportunity. And um, I'm just so thankful as a tour guide and a teacher to be able to share these lessons thanks to public television and thanks to the technology we got right now with our um, tra traveling friends. All right, and we have time for one more question, Rick. Um, Darcia would like to know, when did you start seeing travel as a political act? Do you have a moment or two that that light bulb kind of clicked on for you? Yeah, 
I never really wanted to be political in my travels until I went to Central America after the Sandinista and Contra and invasion of Grenada and all that kind of stuff went on. And up until that time, I, I, my, my life motto was peace through strength, my country right or wrong. And then I, I traveled south of the border and I realized what an impact a lot of our foreign policy and our trade policy and our military policy has on real people. And uh, ever since then, I've had an appetite to learn. I remember when I was a kid, I was in Tehran. I was just 22 years old and I saw a horrible gap between people on the streets and, and people in skyscrapers in Tehran, in Iran. And uh, I saw uh, real poverty in India. But what politicized me really was trips to Central America back in the 80s and 90s. And then 9-11, uh, after 9-11, I realized my mission is to inspire Americans to get to know the other 96% of humanity so our country can be part of the, part of the discussion, part of the family of nations, and it, it really enriches your travel experience. You know, you, you travel thoughtfully and you bring home what, which I think is the most important souvenir and that's a broader perspective. Hey, I wanna remind people, I started off with the, with the fascia, Gabe, and, and this fascia, we think of it as ah Mussolini or Hitler, but it can be a good thing. Uh, it's in our government also, and it's people together, and it's the strength of us individually. Uh, we can be broken, but if we are together, we can be strong. That can be a positive thing, and especially now as we struggle with COVID and 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 we struggle with the need to take care of the gap between the haves and the have-nots and the privileged and the struggling people in our society, we can get over that with a good and caring citizenship. We can be strong in making our nation a better place. And if we're good and caring, we don't need the uh, ax because we know it's right to work together. So we can all enjoy some travels, some peace and some prosperity. Hey, thank you all so much for joining us. I wanna remind you next week, we're going to Cairo. And after that, we're going to the Nile. And right now I'll just once again say, zoom vol, happy travels. Even if we're all just staying home for a little while.